echo what, what Lisa has said, which is um, we're in an environment of, of an absence of data.
lower concentrations. I think there are confounding factors, as Dr. Suchet indicated, if you don't correct for infection and inflammation, it may be a meaningless number or it may give you an overestimate. But uh, I think that there is utility to it. I think we need better tools. I don't know if an MRDR with just a cutoff is sufficient. It's a question to the group up here. And I do think that, you know, to use these tools, something like RBP really needs to have some type of uh, regulation of standardization to ensure the assays are measuring the same thing. Uh, leave that up to several of them. Thank you very much. You, of course, being one of the pioneers in getting some different methods. Did you respond to that? Is that direct to you, Edmund? Um, so, I was at the same meeting that Neil was at, and RBP, there are many different kits out there, and there are many people that are trying to do it in-house, and then of course there's Jürgen Erhard, who does most of the world's RBPs. Um, so RBP will not be correct in severe vitamin A deficiency or during obesity. So that's in respect to the analytical challenges. So it would be nice if RBP had a standardized, a standard out there to be used with all the variety of kits that are being used. Um, it is true that serum retinol will respond, but only when vitamin A status is really poor. And most of the world has actually moved from that, and that is due in part to vitamin A supplementation, taking away these terrible um, signs of xeroxomia. The modified relative dose response usually responds when liver reserves change, either negatively or positively. Um, so it happens to be a little bit more sensitive than serum retinol alone. And we will get into other biomarkers, as I said on Wednesday, during that biomarker session to look at biomarkers of excess. Thank you. Uh, anyone? I just want to add on to Neil's point. We have uh, in the 19, mid 1990s, um, after the supplementation of targeted areas uh, uh, in the south of Thailand due to Siwakdalia, we used the MRGR to help verify after that whether the population is there on um, vitamin A, is, are they okay? to confirm before we phase out vitamin A supplementation. So I think that at a certain point, uh, it's helpful to use more than just serum retinol and to verify the, the possibility that you bring them into a more adequate store. And at that point in time, the Southern Thailand moved into food-based strategies, the promotion of the dietary intake on vitamin A. So those are the things we have to use. Thank you for that comment, Edmond. Just one quick addition. I just wanted to also make the point that I think um, it, it is feasible to measure several biomarkers in a field setting um, you know, with the support of Sherry and NCAP. And the uh, CDC has provided technical support for several recent national surveys where RBP, retinol, and MRDR have been measured. Um, and, and that can really help triangulate the data and kind of address some of these issues. And, and even if the numbers might not line up specifically, can help give you an answer the, the towards is this more of a deficiency issue or there's no deficiency. So I think uh, that, that session went will help clarify, but just to make the point that this is feasible to measure these biomarkers in a field setting. Thank you again. Uh, Rolf from Hill and Keller International, which has long been involved with vitamin A issues also. I was wondering if you might want to make a few observations as opposed to raise a question. So, when the initial vitamin A trials were done, the outcome was all-cause mortality. It's pretty easy to count whether a child is alive or dead. We know that infectious diseases are probably the ones that, that vitamin A operates on. And it's really the severe forms, not so much the incidence. So, um, Mr. Google, maybe the reason you're not seeing changes in incidence or prevalence is what, uh, what vitamin A likely operates on is the more severe forms of infection. 
and that the, the most severe form of omitting is mortality. That's easy to. So I think one has to keep in mind that to some extent the epidemiologic landscape has changed. I mean, we've seen reduced rates of under five mortality, and the, what, the rates that are coming down are largely more quickly coming down to one to fives. That's important. One of the questions, though, is how much of that is, is associated or is vitamin A supplementation programs contributing to that? And it's very different, difficult to disentangle. Although we have results from Nepal and others that show a proof of concept that it's likely to have contributed. So I would argue that particularly in high mortality countries, there has to be a high bar of evidence, either that under one to five mortality no longer happens. So from a, from a, from a mortality perspective, made vitamin A is not necessary. Or that there is evidence both of adequate status and not just status, but there is something that explains that change. It has to be somehow related to diet or something like that. To me, those would be sort of the criteria that should be met before things get stopped. So I just wanted to make that one, one comment. Second is I perceive a lot of pressure to move away, good reasons, single nutrient interventions, and to integrate things more into health systems. There's a value to that. There's also a price to be paid. And we've learned this again and again, that particularly health systems that have weak links to the community, the preventive aspects, particularly after immunizations are done, won't reach most of those kids. And, and so having outreach, whether it's a campaign or some other aspect, has been an incredibly important piece of getting reach. Since we don't have a point of case diagnostics, I can't look at a child and say, you should get supplemented because I can tell if you're deficient. The third point I'd like to make, and this is something I raised to you, is we've often thought, and it has borne out, that giving right of day supplementation does not influence serum retinal levels in the in the long term, maybe you know in, in the first couple of weeks or, or first few months. But my question is, could one imagine that in many of these countries, particularly in Africa, there have been campaigns which have reached children from the time of six months and then 12 months and 18 months and two years and two and a half years of age pretty regularly. It's been a major success. Could that continued dosage perhaps lead to, in some cases, what we're seeing is low levels of deficiency in some countries where I would not have expected to see those deficiency levels. That's one. I guess I'll do that. Thank you, Robert, right. for sharing your experience and wisdom on this. And is there anyone in the panel who would like to reply to Bob's comments? If not, um, we'll probably, I'm afraid we can just have the last two that are standing. Um, and um, the front microphone, please go ahead. Uh, my name is Tawanda Mujinki, I am from the International Cathedral Center. My question uh, uh, is to Sherry. Uh, can you please share your thoughts on uh, beta carotene supplementation instead of using the retinal armitage as the standard? And for the lady from Guatemala, uh, since uh, sugar consumption increases with um, uh, income levels. When the poor are distressed financially, they tend to eat more sugar foods. How is that going to be? How is affecting the the serum retinal intakes in the light of uh, toxicity? Are you monitoring that in Guatemala or not? Thank you. So, as far as the first question on um, whether or not we could use beta carotene as a supplement instead of retinal palmitate. The answer is no for the high dose supplements because the body can only convert a very small amount of that beta carotene to retinol. On the other hand, I truly believe that the ready to use foods, especially that are lipid based or peanut based, should be using beta carotene instead of retinol palmitate. So it's kind of a, a double thing. And if we could get the beta carotene in the micronutrient powders that are given every day, also, that would be really nice. Um, currently, I, uh, DSM is working on beta carotene leaflets that might be able to be used in that regard. Thank you, Sherry. 
uh, when the program was launched in 1985 and the studies began in 1975, we choose sugar because it's what the people are eating. By around five years ago, we recommended to reduce concentration of vitamin A in sugar, but as I told you in my presentation, the legislation is more or slowly changes than the uh, other decisions. The consumption of sugar in Guatemala is high. It's about the average in all groups, 65 grams per day per person. And this is why we like to eat. We are very sweet people. <laughs> and we already recommended to reduce the concentration of vitamin A in sugar. And we think maybe soon we can have a new legislation for do this reality. It's not easy, but I think the oil groups eat the same amount of sugar, especially with the socioeconomic level high. Some of these people's their consumption of sugar sometimes is lower. And it substitutes with other kind of Thank you. Thank you. Uh, did the oil part, yeah. uh, thank you. Uh, great. Uh, an observation, a popular question, I guess. My observation, I'm really surprised that there's very limited data on the effectiveness of the uh, programs over the last 10 years. My thought would be, uh, staff and a company downstairs have developed a multiplex immunoassay that detects RBP, iron biomarkers, iron biomarkers, acute phase proteins, and malaria infection. It's one test, and uh, it may meet the needs of the gentleman in Zambia, it may uh, meet the needs of RBP. We have a paper published with PLOS 1 that came out last week. The CDC has validated it up and soon. Crystal Karachaku, uh, UBC, and Groundworks are also about to publish. And my question is for the gentleman from the CDC and everybody is they're looking for improved um, well, evaluation of micronutrient status of vitamin A. Why would you move from a finger stick to an optical system in terms of trying to process very large numbers of kids to ensure that they have the right of development? What's the advantage? I see that the pain problem the, in terms of processing and costs. Have you looked into that? Thank you, Pam. Hey, just to make sure, so you're saying the, can you repeat the question about the finger stick versus Venus? I didn't quite catch that part of it. Oh, sorry, this is working. And my question is, you have an optical system versus a finger stick. With that, can you test more pins that way than, say, the finger sticks and the optical system? Yeah, I guess my point here, yeah, so, the, so the question was related to, um, you know, the, the, the measurement of like pupillary response or dark adaptation versus a, a finger stick. So, so I, think, I think the difference is, so it's a feasibility question, but it's also like what you're actually trying to measure. So, so I, I guess I was trying to make the, the, the point that um, maybe even if you had the best test for retinal RVP that costs one cent and could be done with a finger stick, is that still really meeting the need for what you're really trying to measure in terms of the, the function of, of vitamin A? So I don't know the answer to that, but I think I think that needs to be looked at as well. And so I think there's, that, there's a big push to kind of be thinking more of rather than a biomarker, a, a bioindicator, and then maybe in nutrition we need to be thinking, you know, not just about status, but really what what's we're trying to measure. So I think that could, so something like that could maybe achieve both, both purposes. But but at the same time, I think yeah, having a more feasible approaches for measuring retinol and, and retinol binding protein with a finger stick is, 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 is the way to go. Just a comment. The finger stick is a good choice for visual vitamin A, hemoglobin, and other maybe another parameters. But you need to should be a, you need to train people to take the sample because maybe you have a good methodology by methods are validated, but the taking of sample is wrong. You need to be monitoring. You need to supervise supervision of that technician in the field, especially because maybe it's more maybe expensive. But if you take 
the samples in the world way to have one result. Thank you, Katarina. Um, we can say no more speak. It's very short. Yeah. Please. I'm Simon Robert from um, International Potato Center. I, I just have two quick questions, one for Iman and one for Sherry. Uh, Iman, I'd like to uh, find out if you're monitoring in the southern uh, parts of Thailand when you read through the supplementation and promoted more of the food-based approaches. Um, over time, are you seeing the stability in vitamin A insufficiency being stable, or are there cases where um, it's going back up? So I'm asking this question because I want to know, for example, if supplementation is taken out of a, of a, of a country program and food-based approaches are promoted more, um, is there a likelihood of uh, vitamin insufficiency returning? Um, and then the question I have for Sherry is, I'd like to know just your thoughts on, do you think that food-based approaches, in particular biofortified foods, are being over-promoted? Relatively short questions and let me be long answers, I think. <laughs> yes, about the uh, uh, possibility that uh, the recurrence. Uh, for the uh, vitamin A deficiency in southern Thailand, uh, in, it was really in early 2000, in a way, we have to monitor uh, that. It's so it's coming to the effect of the regional in the south to do it every five years. So after we start to, first of all, it's more a blanket approach where areas where we have clinical science into vitamin A supplementation. Then we monitor the clinical science five years later, serum retinol, MRDR, and then five years later, after that, we do it again. So just to make sure that that is not really anything, and it moves into the surveillance that was done at the hospital base and also for the food base supposed to kick in. And at that point in time also, the monitoring of infection and control. So parallel approach, increasing breastfeeding promotion. So there are many factor uh, intervention that goes into effect. But all the things that we still keep monitoring is eye signs, is also the blood uh, biomarkers. We stop it. I think uh, we haven't done that. Uh, I have to frankly speak and say, and early 2003, after that, we have not yet go back to uh, do the MRDR or serum retinol in the south again. So those things might be something to think about. Thank you. So the question is, are biofortified foods being over promoted? My dream is that we could get biofortified foods into the feeds of billions so that we could get rid of vitamin A fortification in the preform form. Biofortified foods for pro-vitamin A is beta-carotene and beta-cryptoxanthin, and those particular compounds have health benefits that go beyond optimal nutrition. So with that, I think we're turning it over to Howdy. A very good lady. Um, I, I'll hold off thanking the speakers for, uh, until we've heard from Howdy, and we'll have a uh, just a summary par uh, paragraph maybe about next steps. Um, but in the meantime, um, on behalf of the Micronutrient Forum, I'd like to welcome our new chair, um, Dr. Howdy Burris. Okay, Ian promised me a drum roll. But uh, it was not. I don't. Uh, I don't have a disclosure slide, but I. But I should say that I'm an economist by training, and, and taking over the chair of the Micronutrient Forum Steering Committee. Um, so I want to give a little bit of overview about what the Micronutrient Forum will be doing over the next few years.
implementing activities. Um, we're, uh, we, we catalyze and support organizations to collaborate more efficiently. Um, we're looking for gaps in information and then catalyzing that other organizations, we support them, find funding to help them fill those gaps and discuss. And we have the kinds of panels um, that we've just experienced. And they, those panels raise other questions and then they lead to other panels. So we go, we go from basic research to implementation and eventually having impact on the ground. But what are we going to be doing differently in the future? So first of all, we're going to be much more multi-sectoral than we have been in the past while keeping our strength on the research and implementation of mineral and vitamin deficiencies. We're going to look at, we're going to be multi-sectoral in terms of agriculture, food systems, and health. And uh, we're going to widen our networks within these sectors. We're going to proactively try to include more private sector participation and also younger people in our activities. Um, we're going to be more, much more active in communications and advocacy. Um, in our flagship event, which is the biennial conference, our last one was held in Cancun, we've already taken the decision to hold our next meeting uh, in Bangkok, uh, but we haven't fixed the dates as yet. Um, the composition of the steering committee is going to um, change over time to, re re to reflect the multi-sectoral nature of, uh, of our activities. Now why haven't, why haven't we set the date for the, for the new conference yet, the next conference yet? Well, Micronutrient Forum is going to become now a legal organization. For the past five or six years, Micronutrient Forum has been a program of Nutrition International. And we've been uh, very well supported by Nutrition International. They've provided all sorts of in-kind support. I'd like to thank Homero and his team for all the great work that they've done for the Micronutrient Forum. But because we're becoming a, a legal organization, we're going to now be looking for a new host organization. We'll have a different relationship because we'll be a legal entity writing a contract with a new host organization. Our RFP for expressions of interest uh, will be uh, published shortly, sent out by email. And um, we're hoping for expressions of interest from a broad range of organizations. It'll be a two-step process. Um, we'll, we'll look at the expressions of interest and then uh, determine a short list and, and get more information from them before making a decision. And we're going to we're going to hire an executive director and have a larger staff than we have had in the past. And we're going to transfer a lot of the management. Uh, responsibilities and activities to that staff and then the steering committee will become a board of trustees and have oversight over the activities of the staff. So we're going to have a very, uh, we're going to have a different structure than we have had in the past. Now we don't know how long it's going to take to put all those uh, things in place and that's the reason that we haven't determined the date of the conference because it's the staff that needs to spend uh, a considerable part of their time in uh, making sure that it's an excellent conference. Again, that's, that will con the conference will continue to be our flagship uh, product. So thanks a lot, Ian. Thank you, Howdy. Um, I'm sure we all wish you the best um, as um, the Micronutrient Forum moves into it under your leadership. And maybe one of the things that the Micronutrient Forum will be looking at is taking what's happened today, but as I said, the highly informed uh, presentations we've heard, um, and maybe having some role in looking at coordinating the next steps. Clearly, everyone's identified there need to be some next steps, there needs to be some more data, there needs to be more evidence, um, and, um, and hopefully that will start happening anytime soon. 
So on behalf of my co-chair and myself, I'd like to really acknowledge the speakers and the work they put into it. Um, and thank you for coming. Please, thank you.